All right. Thank you all for coming today to our fourth uh, seminar in the robotics seminar series. So thanks once again to Lockheed Martin for sponsoring the series. Um, the last seminar is going to be Song Bae Kim from MIT on December 2nd. But today we are very happy to welcome Chen Li, um, who's an assistant professor just up the road at Johns Hopkins and is doing some very cool stuff in bio-inspired locomotion. Um, he got his PhD uh, with Dan Goldman in physics at Georgia Tech, uh, then got a very prestigious Miller Fellowship when he was at uh, a postdoc at UC Berkeley, uh, working with Bob Foles' lab. Has had multiple highlight papers and best student papers throughout his career, and we look forward to hearing you talk. So thank you for coming. Thanks, Sarah, for the introduction and for inviting me here. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about my research on uh, the terror dynamics of animal and robot locomotion in complex terrain. And you might be wondering what, what is terror dynamics, and uh, that will become clear in just a few minutes. So, uh, so robots today are envisioned to be, uh, very soon become a major part of society. And over the last couple of decades, we have begun to see a lot of uh, very good uh, robots uh, shown here are mostly terrestrial robots, but we begin to see a huge diversity of robots that begin to venture outside the lab and into the real world to help us uh, in a lot of imp important applications. However, um, if you, if you uh, ask any roboticist, uh, and including the ones sitting here, I think we would all agree that uh, even the best of our robots, they still struggle when, when it comes to complicated environments, uh, such as the ones demonstrated here. By contrast, uh, we know that animals, they move amazingly well. They can pretty much go through any type of environment, uh, as you see from these few examples. So, uh, so what uh, what are the challenges that have prevented our uh, terrestrial robots from achieving um, the locomotive capability uh, on the level of animals? Uh, well, for flight and swimming, we have already had a couple of hundred years of uh, development in the field of aero and hydrodynamics, uh, where we have uh, Navier-Stokes equations, we have computational fluid dynamics, we also have well-established experimental tools such as wind tunnel and flow channel that can help us perform systematic experiments to understand uh, the forces and predict movement. And that has advanced not only our understanding of flight and swimming in biology, but also helped us develop engineering devices that uh, move well in fluids. Uh, by contrast, uh, ironically, our understanding of terrestrial locomotion has largely been limited to that on flat, rigid ground, as you see here, as you see here. Although this, uh, such models uh, from, from these studies have been very successful in helping us divide, uh, develop legged robots that run really well on flat, rigid ground, when it comes to more complicated terrain, uh, such as uh, ground that can flow, like sand, desert sand and Martian soil, or a complicated 3D terrain where you have uh, Huge diversity, a uh, huge diversity of cluttered obstacles. Uh, we don't have very good models to describe the mechanics of the interaction between locomotors and the environment. So, uh, in in other words, to advance our robot robotic mobility in complex terrain and also understanding of animal locomotion in complex complex terrain, we need uh, interaction models on the level of aero or hydrodynamics. In other words, we need terror dynamics. So uh, starting in my PhD, I began to uh, work on this problem with uh, Dan Goldman at Georgia Tech. And uh, before I go into uh, my work, I just want to quickly uh, give an overview of the approach. So, we, so we, we need to create terror dynamics by integrating the studies of biomechanics, bio-inspired robotics, and contact physics. And the, the, useful of, the use, usefulness of this approach is that uh, animals, they, by studying animals, we can reveal the capabilities and limits of locomotion in compl complex terrain. 
and animals also provide proof of concept and inspiration for robots. Uh, on the other hand, robots give us tools to enable pre precise and systematic experiments and allow us to test biological hypotheses. In addition, we, st we can study animals as model organisms and robots as physical models to begin to understand the physics of uh, locomotor ground interaction and that can allow us to discover general principles and create quantitative models that, to enable prediction of forces and movement, which in turn gives us explanation of why animals move so well and also provide design and control tools and rules for robots. So, uh, so in the rest of my talk, I will uh, first talk about uh, a little bit about my PhD work on uh, creating the first aerodynamics of legged locomotion on ground that can flow, such as sand. And then I will focus on uh, my postdoc work where I began to expand aerodynamics beyond granular environment into com complex 3D terrain. And finally, in the last 10 minutes or so, I will talk about uh, my more recent uh, work and ongoing work and my vision to create the next generation aerodynamics for complex 3D terrain. So first, uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about how, uh, how we can perform systematic experiments on controlled granular media to reveal uh, leg control and foot design principles. So as you know, there are a huge diversity of ground that can flow, such as sand, soil, mud, and snow. And in fact, uh, people have studied locomotion on these type of surfaces for decades, and a, a huge uh, entire field called terror mechanics has, uh, has been established to, to model the uh, mobility of large off-ground vehicles, as, as you see here. And one of the main uh, central approximation of, of these models is that if you look at these uh, vehicles, you can see they have either huge wheels or, or large and flat tr uh, tracks. So, so um, because of that, uh, these models can can simplify the interaction or the interface between the vehicle and the ground uh, with, a, with a horizontal plate. So then what you can do is you, you can take a plate, as you see in that picture, and push it into this kind of substrate and measure, uh, for example, the pressure as a function of depth. And then you can integrate that uh, relationship over the interface to, to calculate the, the total lift that you get. And by balancing that with the vehicle weight, you can then <coughs> predict how much you would sink and, and also predict uh, the ability of the mobility of the vehicle. And this is just uh, in the vertical direction. You can also do the same for the horizontal direction to, uh, to eventually predict the performance of, of the vehicle. But it is exactly because of this horizontal plate approximation uh, that these models actually don't work quite so well when your ground interface become highly curved. Uh, in this case, what people have discovered is that these models will overpredict lift and underpredict sinkage, and these have catastrophic consequences, uh, such as the uh, well-known Mars rover Spirit becoming permanently stuck on um, the surface of Mars. And obviously, you can see that these models don't apply to legged locomotion. Uh, in addition, when people study uh, terror mechanics uh, of these vehicle mobility, they have often focused on uh, controlling and varying the parameters of the vehicle. For example, the wheel diameter, the wheel thickness, etc., and studying the, how forces depend on these parameters. Uh, however, less attention has been paid to the ground because obviously these vehicles go outside where the ground uh, is highly variable. Um, so. So ground in these ex experiments or models is not precisely prepared. The best people have done is use a rake to go back and forth and prepare the substrate, try to make it repeatable. So when, we f uh, when I first started working on this problem with, uh, with Dan, uh, with this, as physicists, we decided to, uh, when we think about how we can understand animal and, and bio-inspired legged locomotion on sand, we decided to uh, 
to simplify the problem a bit. So we first choose granular media such as sand as a model system because uh, it's representative, it can flow much like a fluid, but then resolidify uh, depending on the stresses. But also it's relatively simple compared to other substrates uh, such as soil and mud and snow because you only have uh, uh, repulsive forces, there's no cohesion, and also sand is relatively uniform. Uh, I'm, I, from personal experience, I know that isn't true. That, uh, you know, if you try to run on a beach, for example, there are beaches where you yes, really yes. kill yourself. Yes, yes. Beaches where everything will be fine. Yeah, yeah sorry. So, so uh, I forgot. Uh, it's, it's dry ground in the media. That's what, yeah. So I, I didn't. So, so we've decided to focus on dry ground in the media. That's where you don't have cohesion. Yeah. With trigonal, you only have repulsive forces. Yes, but the sand itself coheres differently. Oh, yeah, so that, that's what I'm getting into. All the parameters of the sand will be quite different. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm getting into right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so even, though, even though it's relatively simple, you can see the natural sand can still be highly complex, as you were pointing out. So you can have uneven surfaces, you can have slow, different slopes, and then depending on the compaction, it can have very different mechanical properties. So, as you were saying, in, lo in loose pack sand, you can sink very deeply. In closely packed, you don't sink as much. So then we created a, a device called a fluidized bed uh, with which we can precisely control sand. So what this device does is it blows a large uh, flow of air upward through the sand, and, that, uh, and then the, the sand starts to flow much like a fluid. Um, and then when you slowly turn off the air, they deposit down into this loosely packed state. And then we can also apply mechanical vibrations or air pulses, which is not shown here, that allow us to then gradually compact it to the, the closely packed state. So this gives us uh, analog analogous to the wind tunnel, a knob, so that we can precisely control the compaction and also prepare it into level and flat state. Yes, and in, in fact that really matters. Um, because, for example, when you push an, a plate uh, into sand, we find that the forces that you get can, inc in fact, increase by quite a few times, depending on the compaction. And when we first uh, had this device, we collaborated with Dan Kotochek's group uh, to test uh, their Rex robot, which runs really well on, uh, on relatively rigid ground. Uh, but when we first uh, put this robot onto our granular media, you can see that it doesn't go anywhere. But then if we uh, make the, the, the sand a little bit more compact or slow down, the legs, uh, slow down the legs a little bit, you can see that the robot can now recover locomotion. And vice versa, if we make the ground a bit less compact or speed up the leg rotation a bit, it would transition back to this failure mode. So experimentally, uh, using our device, we can then systematically map out the robot speed as a function of both the compaction of the sand as well as the leg rotation frequency. And uh, I won't go into detail, but as you can see here, this gives us an adaptive leg control curve. Um, so what you can do is, depending on the compaction of the sand you are going into, if you have that knowledge, you can then uh, either s speed up or slow down your, your leg rotation to, to achieve uh, optimal, optimal for performance. And here's a video demonstrating that. So, so here we first make the, the sand uh, loose, loosely packed, and then we manually compacted the, the first part of the sand on the left. And so the robot would first run on more compact sand, and then it'll hit the loose, loosely packed sand. And this video is speed up. So you can see it starts to dig a hole. And then we, we manually we slow down the leg rotation and, and then gradually ramped it up so that it was able to recover movement eventually. So with this, we can, uh, so this is just the first demonstration. We can, uh, in principle, uh, use sensors. Or, or maybe you can imagine you can have a small robot that's less susceptible to sinking to lead in, in the front to map out the terrain and then you can do adaptive uh, control to guarantee successful locomotion. Uh, so, so, so with our, 
Oh, so so with our uh, device, we can also begin to understand the food design principles. So as you see from these examples, there are many animals that uh, run in desert or or other type, kind of environment where the ground can be deformable and can flow. And if you pay attention to their hind legs, you can see that uh, all these animals have extremely elongated hind leg, meaning that their foot is disproportionately long. So biologists have uh, long hypothesized that this might be a morphological adaptation for them to run rapidly on different type of terrain. Um, but the exact mechanism is not uh, understood. So to begin to, to understand that, we, we picked this uh, zebra tail lizard uh, in, from the Mojave Desert in California. And we went out to collect them and then brought them back into our lab and studied how they run on both rigid ground uh, and loose, loose, loosely packed uh, sand. So through our uh, experiments as well as modeling, what we find is that the animal's long, uh, large elongate foot is multifunctional and accommodates the differences in different terrain. Uh, so on solid ground, what we find is that the, the animal has extremely uh, long and thin tendons in their in their foot and toes. And what that gives you is the ability for the tendons to, to stretch uh, when you push down and then to recoil when you push off. So, so that saves, uh, that stores and releases mechanical energy and makes the running more e e economical. Whereas on granular media, the large foot uh, behaves more like a force generating paddle by increasing the surface area, but also allowing deep penetration to, uh, to enhance the force generation and reduce the dissipation of energy uh, into the granular media because it, they, granular media, they deform plast plastically. <clears throat> okay, so now, now that we have uh, studied how animals and, and legged robots move on granular media, we, we wanted to begin to, to see if we can create a, a force model, a physics-based force model to uh, predict locomotion. So, <clears throat> so as you have seen from these previous examples, you can, animals and robots have legs that have really complicated morphology and kinematics. Um, so we came up with this hypothesis. If you break, da break down a complicated foot or leg into small element, as you see in the, in the gray, area, gray regions, you can see that each element, they have three parameters that are different from each other and can change over time. Uh, and those are the depth of the element, the orientation of the element, as well as the movement direction of the element. So we, hypo uh, so we came up with this resistive force hypothesis uh, that if we can use a single plate to map out, experimentally measure, how forces depend on these three parameters, then maybe we can uh, integrate to map out the, the stress, we can then integrate that stress over a complicated foot or leg to calculate the total force. And this might seem trivial, but in fact it's not. For example, in, in the, in, when you move in fluids in the high Reynolds number regime, this, kind of, this integration actually doesn't work because of the interaction of the forces uh, between each element. So we, don't, so we didn't know if it would work, um, but we went ahead and did it. So here is our experiment. We use a robotic arm to push this plate element into, again, well-controlled granular media. And then we varied uh, its orientation and direction and, and m measured both the lift and drag forces as a function of these three parameters. And what I'm showing on the left here is uh, lift coefficient. So this is what you get if you, put, if you push a horizontal plate downward, you get a high uh, lift po coefficient, and but if but what we find is that when your when your orientation starts to deviate from horizontal and when your movement direction starts to deviate from going downward, then actually your lift forces uh, starts to decrease very rapidly. So there is a very sensitive dependence on the movement direction and orientation. So this simply pushing a horizontal plate downward doesn't give you. Uh, information for all these other cases. 
So now we have this database. We can then integrate the forces over a robot leg and, and use a multi-body dynamic simulation to integrate forward the forces to get acceleration and velocity and position. So we can, and what we found is that our model very accurately predict the locomotion of a, a legged robot on granular media. And that's the speed as a function of time for, uh, for one cycle. And, when, and we also tried a different leg configuration. So we reversed the leg, uh, and we found that both the experiment and simulation show that the performance is much lower. So those are, the, those are two trials. We, in fact, mapped out this uh, speed as a function of the leg curvature and leg frequency and found that our model is accurate over a wide range of parameter space. And this also gives us a big uh, a practical benefit. Um, uh, after we experimentally map out these force relationships, uh, this integration and simulation takes only 10 seconds for, to perform for each trial. Whereas if you do experiment, it'll take much longer. And if you use the uh, discrete element model where you calculate forces between each particle, that'll take even longer. So this gives us a rapid design tool for uh, designing uh, leg morphology. And finally, we also, uh, to our surprise, when we made these force measurement in a, a range of different granular media that have very different particle size, shape, friction, uh, compaction, and polydispersity, meaning the distribution of particle size, they, it turned out we found that uh, the, the force dependence on these parameters are surprisingly similar. Uh, the main difference is the magnitude, but the overall shape is very similar. So this gives us a benefit. Um, we, 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 we fit uh, these data to obtain a general force profile. Now that with this general profile, we can again use a, simple, uh, a single measurement by pushing one horizontal plate downward to get the magnitude at, at, this, at, the, the, at the peak and then infer uh, stresses for all these other cases because the shape is the is conserved so so all these previous measurements by pushing a horizontal plate can still be applied but now we have the ability to predict legged locomotion <coughs> yes yes yeah 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 that's a good question so um so the, yeah, in, in the experiment, the, the robot legs is mostly rigid, but if you have a compliant leg, you can still, in principle, apply the, the model because the, model, the, the three parameters are the uh, orientation, movement direction, and the depth. So, so if you had, uh, say, a model of how the legs would deform, you would still be able to know these parameters and apply the model. But obviously, you would need to develop that compliant leg model. Yeah, so, so then uh, starting in my postdoc, I, uh, I started uh, going beyond granular media. And what I decided to study is if we can begin to ex expand terror dynamics into complex 3D terrains. So there, uh, so, so robots, so there are many different uh, complex 3D terrains, as the, such as the ones you see here where we need robots to venture into and, and really traverse obstacles to help us. For example, helm surface, building examination, and search and rescue, whereas uh, our current robots still don't move quite well. They often become stuck, as you see here, or they can't really uh, gain purchase, whereas uh, you have seen earlier that animals do really well. So, so again, um, uh, so you see this there are this huge diversity of, of terrain, and each of them is complex enough. So how do we begin to understand them? So again, inspired by a, a wind tunnel, we decided to, to take a simple example, which is grass. And then even for grass, the natural grass can be complicated. So what I came up with is uh, laser cutting paper into beams and then assembling them uh, through a, a custom base so that I can 
control and vary the geometry, the stiffness, and the spatial configuration, etc. And for example, here's a video showing how I can change the orientation. Um, so now, again, I have a, a device analogous to wind tunnel to enable uh, precise and systematic experiments. And then to, to begin to understand how animals do it, uh, traverse this type of terrain, I decided to study the discoid cockroach, which is native to uh, Central America, the rainforest there. And as you can see, there are a lot of clutter with uh, dense vegetation, leaf litter, uh, even like parts of uh, trees the animals have to go through on a daily basis. So I decided to challenge these uh, core cockroaches through really uh, cluttered beams that are narrowly spaced. And here is a representative trial. So you can see that the animal, animal runs very rapidly into it, collides with it, and then it, in this case, it, uh, it tries to push forward through the first couple of layers and climbs up and then falls forward and traversed. And this trial took about four seconds. And, here, uh, and this is the locomotive mode sequence that I can write down for this trial. And then here's another trial which is quite different. So you see that in this trial the animal again collides and stops. But then uh, instead of doing all that, the animal simply pushes forward and then it very quickly rolls its body and maneuvers through the narrow gap, which is less than half its body width, and traversed. And it only took about 1.5 seconds. And here's the locomotor mode sequence of this trial. So here are the two trials that you have just seen. Now with our device, we can then perform these uh, hundreds of times uh, with multiple animals. And, and what we, found, we find is that there's this very complicated locomotor transition pathways that the animal can take. So the animal start, always starts here and uses either one or a sequence of this diversity of modes to eventually traverse. Uh, but you can also see uh, the, the thickness of these arrows are proportional to the probability of each pathway uh, relative to the total number of trials. You can also see that among this diversity of pathway, there's this particular one where the animal wrote does the most often by rolling to maneuver through the narrow gaps. And that also turns out, when we measure the time, to be the fastest. Uh, when the animal does that, it on average it takes only two seconds. Whereas if it ever uses any other slower modes, it takes significantly longer. So this fastest or perhaps most effective pathway is, occurs the most frequently. Yes? Um, did you find the cockroaches had any sort of memory or were able to? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, in this case, we have not. So we, what I have tried is, look, I have these hundreds of trials. What I have tried is calculate the, uh, their probability of using different modes and see if, the, if that correlates with time, if there's any increase or decrease. And I didn't see that evidence. But, but I'm, I don't know much about like memory and learning. So I think to really nail that, we, we might need to collaborate with people who, with expertise. Yeah. Yes. Similar to that question, did you notice that the cockroaches would always go the least effective path the first time, and then go the uh, I guess the faster route like after that, or would they ever do the fast route the first time? Uh, so I, so, okay, so uh, if I were to guess, I, just based on the, my observation, I I don't think they they are learning to do it. I think that they have this probability distribution, and it. Well, Given that, is I think it's more random okay. from my impression. And, and my hypothesis is that over here, when I run the experiments, I'm really scaring the hell out of them. I, have, <laughs> I, I picked them up. I put them here. I had a little brush. And they had these uh, sensory hairs on their rear that if you have anything getting close, they, they know something is coming, and they run away. And sometimes, if they, like sometimes they get accustomed. So I would just use the brush to beat on them. <laughs> so, so I think what I think they are, they just don't care. They just want to get out of the way. So they they are they're not worried about like trying to learn to do it. That's my hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. It would depend on, on exactly what they hit. If they hit the paper, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If they hit the 
Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's a very good uh, insight. Yeah, that, actually, that's what I'm get, getting into. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. What's the explore section in the figure? Oh, so, so this I call exploration. Um, what the animal does is, uh, if you look the, at the top view, what the animal does is it would often come here, it'll hit and stop, and then, uh, not all the trial, but very often they would kind of go back and forth trying to find a, find a way to go through. Yeah. So that's what I call explore. But it's, more, it's in terms of the kinematics, it's mostly deflecting to one side or the other. Yeah, so, so, so also we also worked with uh, Ron Fearing's lab and, and used uh, one of their robots. So here's the uh, Velocity Roach robot that runs uh, very, very rapidly on open surface. But when we first uh, tried it on, on the scaled up beams, even when the beam width is larger than the body width of the robot, you can see that the robot rarely traversed. So I think there's a typo on the, on the numbers here. Uh, Not, uh, okay, I'm not sure why it's not playing, but, but what we find is that the robot very rarely roll like the animal. It almost always t like turn yaw to the left or right and become entangled within the beams. And the probability of traversal is less than 20%. So, so, then, uh, so then I was wondering why the animal is doing so much better than the robot. And when you compare them, one of the most obvious difference you can see is their body shape. The animal is well-rounded, much like a thin slice of an ellipsoid or a football, whereas the robot is highly angular. You have these uh, straight edges, these right corners, and flat faces. So I was inspired by, again, the fluid case where you have streamlined shape that, that's found in almost all fish and birds uh, that fly that can reduce drag. Um, so I hypothesized maybe this kind of well-rounded shape is streamlined for a cluttered terrain. So how do we test the hypothesis? Uh, I then gave my cockroaches little backpacks. <laughs> so by, by systematically uh, using these backpacks to, to reduce their body roundness and increase the angularity of the body while controlling for the friction, the mass, and the volume, uh, I showed that... Um, that indeed, as, uh, as we predicted, the probability of, of, of body rolling and maneuver through uh, reduces with, uh, with the body shape, uh, with the body round uh, ang angularity, and that, re that decreased the performance. So having... Uh, oh, uh, if they still get through, they just used a different approach, or did they just get stuck in... Uh, oh, yeah, so, so the, these are... So actually, we... Um, I don't have it on my slides, but for... Each of these cases, I, I mapped out this distribution, and basically, when you increase the angularity, this pathway becomes small. The probability, the other ones become larger. Yeah. yeah, and also to answer your guys' question here, we also were wondering maybe if if there's any memory or learning. So, we started there. And once we uh, finish all these experiments, we run the animal again without any shells and got exactly the same performance with no statistical difference. So I think that's, again, evidence that they are not, at least in this case, when they're escaping, they're not learning. Can you test us? Oh, uh, with a bit of hot glue. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, so, so having confirmed our, our hypotheses, we can then uh, use this ter teradynamic streamlining to enable our robots to go through. So here you can see simply adding this rounded shell uh, and no changes in, in leg control or adding sensors, the robot can simply push forward and roll uh, just in response to the mechanical interaction. And even, and even when the shell width is now wider than the gap. Yeah, and, and also, uh, so, so here I just demonstrated this, our first discovery of this Dynamic, dynamic streamlining that helps roll maneuver. But um, I think there might be the, a much broader concept of pterodynamic shapes. Uh, for example, in both our animal and robot experiments, we find that when you have a higher angular b body shape, like a rectangular plate, 
that actually facilitates climbing. So, so, and there may also be other shapes that help you turn left or turn right. So these are uh, topics that we're currently working on. Uh, yeah, so, so next, uh, a bit about morphing shapes. So, so, when we, so this is very well, the robot can traverse, but sometimes it, it overrode and flip over and can never recover because obviously this shape is stable when you're upside down. Whereas the animals, they, they also sometimes uh, flip over, but they can always very quickly recover. So this got me interested in uh, studying this particular problem, the self-riding after flipping over. And through uh, experiments, we find that, as you see in this video, the animal actually uses their wings. So they, their wings are multifunctional when uh, normally they, they're closed to provide protection and help with obstacle traversal with their streamlined shape. But when flip, flipped over, the animal can open them rapidly to help themselves, uh, the, to help them riding, ride themselves. Uh, so, so what we then did is we simply cut the shell in half and then added actuators. So now the robot can open its wings much like the animal does. And now uh, we, can, we can test if the robot can do it. And also, uh, now the robot gives us a physical model to systematically vary parameters, such as the speed, the magnitude, and even the asymmetry between the left and right wing to uh, better understand the principles of self-riding. So, so here is a trial of the robot uh, opening its wings to a, to a small magnitude or at a slow speed. And what we find is that it can't ride. But when we open the wings to a larger angle or open it faster, then the robot can successfully ride dynamically. And, and we have performed these systematic experiments and find that the riding probability increases with both uh, wing opening magnitude and speed. And the riding time also decreases. So opening it faster and to a larger angle gives you higher performance. Uh, also, we can, we can test uh, interesting biological hypotheses from our animal experiment. Uh, from this video, you can see that uh, the animal initially always opened two wings together because they are controlled by the same group of muscle, uh, so they would pitch up. But uh, very often, uh, before the animal can perform this uh, full pitch, it would start to uh, rotate to the left or right, uh, and the body rotation is asymmetric to this vertical plane, and that happens uh, over 90% of the time. Only a few percent of the time the animal would actually do a full pitch. So we, so we wondered maybe this, can, this asymmetry can give the animal some advantage. So to test that, we can open the left and the right wing of the robot uh, to different angles, and we find that uh, some cases you fail, sometimes you can write yourself, but you can also have underwriting and overriding. Uh, so, so, so by defining the writing probability, we can, again, map out the writing probability as a function of both the left and the right wing opening magnitude. And what we find, uh, not very surprisingly, is that when the wing openings are large, like above 100 degrees, you can see the probability is high, is quite high, even uh, whether with or without asymmetry. But but really, what's really surprising is that when you, your wing opening is small, below 100 degree for both the left and right wing, you actually have higher probability with asymmetry compared to the perfectly symmetric case, which is on this diagonal line. So I think what this suggests is that when you're an animal, you might get tired uh, trying to do this. And when you're a robot, when you run, run low on power, you can actually take advantage of asymmetry to help you uh, help increase the chance of your self-writing. Okay, so, so in the last uh, part of the talk, I will um, discuss a little bit of, about um, our recent modeling and ongoing work to, to, uh, towards the next generation terror dynamics um, using the novel concept of locomotion energy landscape. So, um, excuse me. So, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of going through complicated uh, 
3D terrain where you have many obstacles, the dominant uh, current approach is, is to use uh, sensor-based path planning to, um, to map out the environment and do self-localization, find out where you are, and then plan the trajectory to avoid all the obstacles. And the, the main models that have been used, uh, these are two of the very early ones, but, the, but the, most of the models are based on these ideas where you, when you map the environment, when you detect there's an object somewhere, you create an artificial potential field and that gives you a virtual force to repel you away. So you basically uh, go around it, you avoid any physical contact. However, as the names of these models suggest, they're, they're really artificially defined to facilitate uh, rapid computation, and they, they, are, they, are not, they do not arise from the actual physical contact. And because of that, uh, these models, they are highly successful in avoiding obstacles, but when your obstacle become too dense, you can't really go through them. And in addition, these approaches uh, can be also challenging when you move, when you move very rapidly uh, in complex terrain, as you see from this example. Uh, this is a little robot running on campus you, with a camera. You can see you just keep bouncing into things uh, very quickly that doesn't allow you to do real-time path planning. Yeah, so, so how do we begin to, uh, to complement such model by adding the contact physics? Uh, so I was inspired uh, by uh, a recent work that done by Matt Mason at CMU, where they, uh, what you are looking at is a problem of robotic arm trying to grasp objects. So here, that physical contact is essential for the, for the completion of the tasks. So what they did is um, they have this very simple grasper, which is, which is a, a few fingers with, with springs attached to them. So, and then they can come up with this very simple physics model. Basically, the spring will, uh, with the st stiffness of the spring and the geometry, you can, you can know how much you have to deform and how much potential energy is stored in the spring. So they can then derive this physics-based potential uh, models that begin to allow them to predict statistically how you may be able to grab objects of different shapes. So inspired by this, uh, I created a very simple model to begin to see if I can understand uh, these complex interactions. So if, if you take an uh, animal or a robot and two adjacent beams and just simplify them as, uh, you simplify the two beams as, as plates with, with torsional springs at the base so the beam can bend in this direction and then you simplify the animal or robot body as a simple ellipsoid, you can then write down the potential energy of the system as a function of the uh, translational and rotational degree of freedom of the, this rigid body. Um, and then, and then the, we ask the question, if we allow the body to freely rotate at each position, uh, what uh, would be its orientation that gives you the lowest potential energy? And that's what we get. So that's the lowest potential energy, basically the potential energy minimized over rotation degrees of freedom as a function of uh, x, y, x and y in the horizontal plane. And uh, what, what we find is that uh, this interaction of the object with the two plates uh, gives you these two potential high potential barriers uh, but in the middle, there's a, it's still a potential barrier, but it's much lower. So you have a sort of a valley there. And for you to reach that state uh, at that position, the, this, this body has to flip up on its side. Whereas if you are a little bit closer to one beam or the other, uh, if, you are, if you are near one beam but, but a bit further away in the x direction, then you, you can actually just sit on the ground. If you are close to one beam but closer to the beam, then you actually need to pitch up and the beam will deflect a little bit. So these uh, three modes uh, correspond very well to our animal observation. You can see that the animal, uh, when, it's cl when it's in the middle of the two beams, it tends to roll its body, whereas if it's uh, closer to one beam or the other, it tends to either deflect or pitch up and climb. 
and <coughs> and what's what I think is is even more interesting is if you look at the probability of these different modes, you can see that in the very middle when you when you try to go through in the middle go through this low barrier, you have high probability. If you try to go over these higher barriers, you actually have lower probability. So the probability of going through different pathways is anti-correlated anti with the height of the barrier there. So this is analogous to the microscopic systems where you, your particles occupy different energy states and that probability distribution is anti-correlated with, the, with the, the, the energy level. Yeah, and we also find similar observations in robots. And our model can also begin to, uh, to, to capture the dependence on shape. Uh, for example, when we run the model with a highly angular cuboid versus a rounded ellipsoid, you can see that in both cases you get two barriers with a valley in between. But if you look more closely, this angular shape gives you not only higher barriers uh, and a narrower valley, but also if you look at the, the gradient of, of these energy surfaces, you can see that here in the middle you, <coughs> you, ha you, you, you must be right in the middle to, to, to stay there. If you are a little bit towards one side, you actually have these repulsive forces that pushes you away from the gap and into the beam. Whereas here, you have these attractive forces that draws you towards the middle. <coughs> and that, again, corresponds with our observation of the probability distribution, uh, the difference between the two shapes in both animals and robots. So even though this is an extremely simple model, uh, it begins to reveal the physics of this interaction. Yeah, so with that, I would like to thank uh, my advisors and a lot of the people that I have worked with over the years, um, my current group members, and the, f the funding agencies that have supported uh, our work. And if you want to learn more, you can go to my website or contact me. Yeah. Thank you all very much. What about the scalability of these models, like uh, so the self writing and all that with the wings? How will it work for, say, a bigger uh, robot than a cockroach? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, so, okay, so I didn't go into it. So for the self writing, uh, we yeah we started trying to to also understand the uh, the dynamics. So the the locomotion energy landscape is more to get at the different paths, how how you might go this way or the other, but. We are also developing a very simple, like Lagrangian type of model, uh, to describe. Right now, we can describe the falling phase, and that's 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 kind of uh, expected. It turns out it's just some a rigid body f falling under gravity. You can well predict its movement, and and with that model, we can then predict, say, when you go to, from a size of a cockroach to a robot. Obviously, with a higher inertia and larger size, you would slow down. But um, another thing we also did is we collaborated with Chad Kessens, who is actually a student here, but he also works at Army Research Lab. And he has expertise in, pot in path planning and potential field in self-writing. So what we did is use his model to look at the dependence on the shape of the shell. Um, so, uh, so, so in so that model, it, it doesn't capture the size, but with that model, we, we were able to demonstrate that both, both the animal and robot, they are operating in this dynamic regime, meaning that they, they really, as they push up, they really accumulated a lot of kinetic energy. By the time that they, they reached the highest position, they had, they had extra kinetic energy to help them go over the barrier. Whereas uh, there are many, self-riding robots that do it more in a quasi-static way. So basically they, they reconfigure the shape until the center of gravity falls out of the ground contact basin. But here, that doesn't have to be the case. You can just use your kinetic energy to go out. Yeah. Yes. There's yes. another creature that self-writes rather surprising, that's the turtles. Yes, yes. Uh, they're yeah, they're actually quite huge. Big, turtles, and they are able to self-write. Yes, yeah. They use, I guess they use their neck. Yes, yeah, 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 that's a very good point, yeah. So, yeah, actually, I looked into that literature a little bit, 
um, in in one study uh, they they looked so they looked at turtles of different sh shell shapes and and also biologists have found that the ones that normally have very flat very thin shells they have really long necks and then the there are, there are ones that have shells that are much taller and there, there there's even one that its shell has a shape that Mathematically, they found it to be, to be, uh, I've forgotten the, the word. It's, it only has one stable equilibrium point, whereas all the other shapes have two. So they find that that particular turtle, it doesn't have to do anything. It just falls over. Yeah. So, but they they were able to, yeah, as you were saying, they were able to, to mathematically using this potential energy explanation to explain the cor anti-correlation. Of the neck length with the short height. Yeah. Yes. For your model for the robot uh, running on sand, at what point does the scaling of the foot size affect your whole model? Like, if it's really the foot size is really small yeah, yeah. compared to the particle size. Or oh, I see. I see. Yeah. 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 That's a very good point. So, so our model only. Yeah. I, I didn't mention that, but our, mo our our model certainly has limitations. So. So that's one of them. Like it, your your leg or foot size must be large enough so that the particles can be treated as a continuum. If you're, if you're, if you are like, like say an ant, your feet, the size of your feet is actually comparable to the particle. So at that scale, it won't work because when you push on one particle, it it won't move with all the other particles in the same way where you have a really large object pushing on many particles. Yeah. Laws make a difference. Uh, yeah, so um, that that's a very good qu question. So, so one hypothesis that we had is that um, we also in our lab there are other students in my PhD lab there are other students who also looked at turtles, how they crawl, and over there they they have this large flipper that also gives you large surface area. But the difference of that with the lizard foot is that the foot because they are it's not continuous. They, it can actually penetrate, penetrate, like here's sand. It can penetrate like this. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the flipper, it doesn't really push, penetrate much because it's such a large area. So, so if if you, with the with a large foot, if you simply push down and then move this way, you will slip. So what the turtle does is it actually will bend its its kind of wrist joint here, so that it does, kind of does that. Whereas the lizard can simply just push, and the foot takes care of the penetration. Yeah. I was also thinking of things like impalas and cheetahs. Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so we haven't looked at that. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but <laughs> but one thing that um, I I, dis I had a, actually I had a discussion with Sam Bae Kim, who who will be here next week. So, uh, so when I first saw the like you know Sam Bae Kim and the, his he has been developing the MIT cheetah robot. And also, Boston Dynamics has their version of the cheetah, but they have really different uh, leg morphology. So, so the Sambay Kim's cheetah, it has. So here's the kind of the body, and if you look at here's the head. This is going forward. If you look at the cheetah robot of Sambay Kim, it has this leg morphology that's similar to the real animal. Whereas the MIT cheetah, if you look at it, it's leg is the opposite. It's kind of like this. So the leg pushes this way. Here it pushes this way. So, so when I first saw these uh, from our uh, granular force measurement, I can tell that this one, even though the, this one, they demonstrated it runs rapidly on treadmill. If you put it on sand, this is not going to give you any force in terms of thrust. So you'll very quickly dig a hole, whereas this one can be much better. And that's like the real animal. To make to Song Bay. Yeah, I actually mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe we can save that question for afterwards because we're a couple minutes over. And thanks, speaker, one more time. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize. Uh, no. Thank you. That, that, very good question. Things that happen to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 Not covered by. Uh, no.